Um, hi everyone, thanks for thanks for being here. Um, I have a, 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 a cat uh, on my lap at the moment who is um, uh, behaving himself at the moment, but may at some point uh, try and run over the laptop as, as cats are wont to do. So uh, uh, maybe uh, maybe that's the like Chekhov's gun of this talk, uh, that at some point uh, something terribly exciting might happen, um, <laughs> uh, which is to say a cat uh, running across the screen potentially. Hello, hi everyone. Uh, enough of cats, let's talk about what I'm, I'm here to talk about today, which is uh, a book which has a, uh, a, a very uh, pre-modern kind of style of title, which is Nazar, Pillars of Gladness, or because every uh, you know, magician uh, yearns to have a, a book with a million titles. Uh, a geomancer's angelical psalter of calls containing vessels 19 with which to water the earth. And I'm incredibly grateful to Hadian Press and to uh, Elizabeth especially uh, for all their help in, in putting this together and designing it together and in, uh, in going uh, through my innumerable edits and uh, afterthoughts and things like that. I'm, and I'm really glad to put this out. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity to get to talk about uh, what the heck I'm trying to do with it and, and how it can be helpful in other people's magical practices. So I've got some slides uh, to kind of kick us off, which is first of all, uh, you know, to attack the question, so to speak, to ask like, what the what the heck is a geomancer's angelical psalter? Well, uh, geomancy can mean many things to many people. Um, uh, sometimes people use it to refer to uh, all sorts of rock magic, for instance, uh, or um, like prehistoric petroglyphs and things like that. Some people use it to talk about ley lines. Uh, it, it's one of the terms that a variety of Taoist sorceries and uh, feng shui gets translated as into English. But I'm here to talk about European Renaissance geomancy, the, 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 the computational divination. Uh, involving the the 16 figures of geomancy, which if you're not familiar with them, uh, look a little bit like the travel Yi Ching, but instead of hexagrams of six broken or unbroken lines, it's four. It's like a, a, a quartet or a tetragram, I guess we could call them. And I think the main thing to, to say about geomancy is that it maps patterns of possibility and the unfolding of occult virtue and the, and the, and the actions of nature. Uh, according to uh, 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 these 16 figures, that chart uh, a very dialectical unfolding of patterns and when i say dialectical i i, I mean literally that uh one figure is is, is considered uh, it might map a situation or a person another figure might map another person and the interaction of those figures produces another figure right um and we can get into more of the, the details of that if if, if if needs be but but one of the the underlying principles here is that we are mapping the patterns of nature and how different patterns in nature interact with each other right thesis antithesis synthesis and this is one of the ways that geomancers work their art to navigate influences of of spirits and the virtues of place of, of actions uh, of particular materia and so on. Uh, and if you want a, a real like thumbnail pricey, uh, it's sometimes said that geomancy is a, is a dirt astrology. It's sometimes said to be a sister art of astrology. Um, we can get more into the details of that if, if needs be, but that's the kind of geomancy I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, this for instance is a, a picture of one of my, my old workings. This is the geomantic figure of conjunctio. Uh, I can kind of do gang signs for them as well. If you see it's two dots, then one dot, then one dot, then two dots. And so it represents this kind of cross. Uh, and it, it, it is a figure that represents the crossroads. It's a mercurial figure. Um, I consider it a very Gemini type figure um, uh, of uh, uh, all those uh, uh, things that you find Mercury doing at night, uh, the, the crossroads uh, uh, and so on. The second part of, of this angelical Psalter for geomancers is, is what do I mean by angelical? Well, in short, what I mean is the language called Enochian that was channeled by Dr. John Dee and Edward Kelly in the 1580s. And some of this talk is going to go into a little bit of that history. I'm not going to dive too deeply uh, because it is uh, there's, 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 it's, it's a set of uh, glorious uh, esoteric uh, rabbit holes and things uh, and uh, manuscript studies and occult philosophy to get into. So I'm gonna just try and give us the, the basis and some of the particular things that inspired me in the course of putting this book together. The main thing really is that angelical or the Enochian language uh, is said to be the natural or original language, uh, if not of creation itself, the language that God spoke to create things. It's at the very least the language that Adam spoke in the Garden of Eden, the, the first ancestor, the first magician, the first man, the first person, right? The first human person. Uh, I'm going to explore a little bit about that. Um, the function, if we want to put it like that, of this 
language as a ritual language is that it's used to articulate the, the calls or keys that Dee received uh, to call spirits to reveal mysteries about the fundamental nature of God the highest, of the nature of nature itself. And so hopefully you're already seeing where I'm, I'm going with this in terms of both of these, this divination system and this ritual language are both used to not just name all the animals in creation, but also potentially make pacts with them uh, and to articulate the mysteries of nature in one of its original languages, right? So we're gonna explore that kind of concept, th these kinds of concepts. So let's think a little bit about the guy that first channeled this language, Dr. Dr. John Dee. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm quoting here deliberately from the incredibly uh, esoteric source of Libra Wikipedia. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this uh, is not just to annoy uh, 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 people <laughs> who uh, who have to mark essays and are routinely annoyed by students doing this, but just so we get a sense of the common knowledge of, of, of who Dr. D was, an English mathematician, an astronomer, an astrologer, a teacher, an occultist, uh, and an alchemist. Uh, he's famous as uh, being an advisor to Elizabeth I, uh, and indeed, yes, spends much of his time on, on alchemy, divination, and hermetic philosophy. He's often credited as uh, uh, putting together one of the largest libraries and even kind of refining the concept of a public library itself or of a research library. Um, he's also said to coin the term British Empire itself. Uh, he's certainly not just setting the astrological date of the, the Queen's coronation. He's also very interested in what the ships are doing. He's uh, credited as inventing a, a particular form of uh, astronomical navigation that allows this nascent British Empire to, to spread its colonialism far and wide. Um, it's said that he eventually leaves Elizabeth's service uh, on a quest for additional knowledge in the deeper realms of the occult and the supernatural. And this is often the like kind of history of science take on D, which is, you know, he's a brilliant mathematician and, and astronomer and uh, a natural philosopher. And then he gets all caught up in, in chasing spirits. And there is this idea that once you have amassed one of the largest libraries in the world and you've spoken to, you know, the peers that you can find, like, who do you speak to next, right? Well, for D, that's, you know, trying to talk to the, the spirits of, of God the highest. Uh, it's often talked about that this quest leads him to uh, become you know, kind of ruined and, and penniless. His uh, his library is vandalized when he returns uh, from uh, spying on the King of Poland and doing these, these, these tours of Europe where he's gathering books and also gathering intel. Um, and it's said that he dies in poverty. Um, the antiquarian uh, John Aubrey describes him in very humoral terms as tall and slender, wearing a gown like an artist's gown with hanging sleeves uh, and a slit, a very fair, very clear, sanguine complexion, a long beard as white as milk, a very handsome man. Uh, and I like that kind of little personal detail uh, there of, of thinking about this, you know, giant of, uh, of occult philosophy and certainly of, of early modern English magic. So, Rather than go too far into biography, we're, we're here to talk about descrying, really. And so uh, I wanted to start by quoting uh, Jorge uh, Sionzi, uh, estimating that Dee seems to have become interested in divination in 1569 and started scrying in 1579. And while Edward Kelly is, 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 is clearly instrumental for the reception of a lot of the work that we call Enochian, there are many actually a couple of different systems we could probably say uh, in the wider corpus of, of something we could call Enochiana. Um, but, it, but, but Kelly is not Dee's only scryer. His first well-documented instance of, of the practice is with help from a medium, Barnabas Saul, which takes place just after the, the solstice, interestingly. And we do see that Dee's big operations do seem to often tie to uh, events, if not in the wider kind of Christian uh, calendars than his own personal kind of calendars. A lot of stuff happens on his birthdays, uh, which I find interesting. Of course, Dee's most infamous set of magical operations, as, as, as we say here, is, is conducted with the scryer Edward Kelly between March 1582 and at least May 1587. And we have Dee's uh, copious notes, uh, records, and journals to thank for these sometimes incredibly precise dates that things were received. And it's Deborah Harkness's opinion that Dee's relationship with uh, uh, this scryer after Kelly um, uh, over the, the summer of 1591 marked the beginning of a period of waiting and conversing with angels that was to last nine years and several months. And this operation is not talked about as much, partly because D, the, the, the period comes around uh, or, or, or culminates and D has not received the things he was meant to or, or the world has not ended or um, a variety of things don't seem to have happened. The, the date seems to have been confuted in vain or as vain. Uh, and so on the 29th of, of, of September on Angelmas, right, on Michaelmas uh, 1600, 
D had manifested his disappointment by burning the angel diaries that he had kept during those nine long years. Um, and I mentioned this because uh, one of the difficulties of, uh, of studying and practicing Enochian magics uh, is that uh, there's an awful lot of missing material. Uh, some of that is as a result of it being uh, lost over the last 400 odd years, right? Um, but an awful lot of it was also destroyed by D himself. Uh, and that's that's worth bearing in mind uh, that we are always dealing with, we're often dealing with um, systems that might be perfectly workable. Uh, and I, and I, I would argue are often very workable, uh, but are not necessarily complete as inbox original mint condition, shall we say. So why scrying, right? Just to reiterate this point, there's there's some of the the whens and the what and the, and, the, and the hows uh, uh, and the whats, but but why? I think it's fair to say that scrying was resorted to uh, by by Dr. D in order to acquire the highest knowledge. That's that's routinely what these calls and prayers that he receives tend to be saying that he's after understanding of the cosmos and he had sought other means of learning this language of nature, writing, "I have sought to find uh, or get some inkling, glimpse, or beam." of such the foresaid radical truths. And by radical, we're talking about the root of things, radix, right? The fundamental truths of, of nature. But after all my aforesaid endeavor, I could find no other way to such true wisdom attaining, but by thy extraordinary gift of being able to, to speak with angelic spirits uh, via a showstone and a variety of other prayers uh, and ritual paraphernalia. So it's worth noting that Dee's point was not merely to see the, these angels, but to speak to them about the language of Adam. That's 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 an, uh, uh, the language that Enoch speaks. That's that's why it gets called Enochian. Uh, but not only speak about that language, but maybe even speak in the language of Adam and Enoch. Uh, it's we, we we have this this little uh, uh, note from D. I have read in thy books and records how Enoch enjoyed thy favor and conversation with Moses. Thou wast familiar, and also that's to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, Joshua, Gideon. Uh, Ezra, Daniel, Tobias, and sundry others, thy good angels were sent by thy disposition to instruct them, inform them, help them, yea, in worldly and domestical affairs, yea, and sometimes to satisfy their desires, doubts, and questions of thy secrets. And furthermore, considering the showstone which the high priests did use by thine own ordering. So this is not just a, a ritual historiola, although that's very important for us to think about the ritual precedent of you have spoken to these prophets before, and I, I seek to at least speak in the language of the prophets, if not kind of become a prophet myself, says D here, right? Um, and, and Harkness points out each prophet had served as a divine scribe as well. The link between prophecy and writing the things down that God or the angels tell you is, is incredibly important. You're meant to obediently record the information received from God and the angels in these books of wisdom. And that's supposedly what, what Enoch does. It's also supposedly what Adam does. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. But this is not just saying, oh, you did it for them, so why not do it for me? Also getting at the way in which it was done with a, with a, with a, the, the, the showstone here. We're, we're talking very like Urim Thurim stuff. We're talking breastplate of Aaron stuff. Uh, and that it's by God's uh, will that these angels are sent, you know? Uh, it's, you know and, and here we have the start of the fascinating sets of tensions in studying uh, the, materia, the, the material that we can call Enochian in terms of this perpetual like anthropology of, of religion and magic, where uh, on the one hand, we're just praying for God to do a thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's up to God and the angels ultimately, says D. But also we're trying to make that happen, right? This is this, this root tension here, I think. So let's talk about Enoch a little bit. I think one of the, we can say many things about uh, Enoch or Idris or, or Unuch, um, the, the, the Safra Rabbah, the great scribe, right? Uh, but I think, his role as ancestor of book magic is probably one of the, the more pertinent ones, certainly for, for me in the course of putting this, this book together. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that we're not talking about Enoch, the son of Cain, or indeed the city named after him, uh, uh, but a, an Enoch that comes a little bit later, the Enoch that is sometimes identified as Hermes Trismegistus. He's the son of Jared, who was the, the father of Methuselah, and is the great grandfather of Noah. He is seventh in the line from Adam, right? So he's the, 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 the seventh generation after Adam. Uh, Book of Jubilees tells us that Enoch was the first amongst men that are born on earth who learned writing and knowledge and wisdom and who wrote down the signs of heaven. So here we have this, you know, birth of writing, one of the first uh, bookmakers, one of the first scribes of these books of wisdom. What was and what will be, he saw in a vision in his sleep. 
as it will happen to the children of men throughout their generations until the day of judgment. He saw and understood everything and wrote his testimony and placed the testimony on earth for all the children of men and for their generations. So here's this idea again, that it's not just, oh, he was really smart or he had this special connection with God or even that, oh, he invented writing, how cool. It's that he, he invented this stuff in order that it be passed down. The idea of, 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 of transmission becomes really important here of the reception of this stuff, not just Enoch's reception and, and conversing with God in, 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 in this original language, but also uh, recording it and leaving it for next generations to be able to work with, precisely because he has seen all things that will come to pass, right? So he's, again, he's, he's, he's aware of this, uh, uh, this uh, historicist unfolding of, of God's plan, but he's also taking an active part in it. And the Jewish Encyclopedia says that we can think about Enoch as a student of the books of Adam, interestingly. So it, which raises a great question, right? If, if Enoch like is the first to create writing and knowledge and wisdom and things, what, what are the books of Adam then? Uh, well, they're not, they're, they're, they might be texts. That might be a way we can think about it. Um, they're often said to be put in stones as opposed to in, in, in the leaves of a book. Um, and so here we have, again, this link between stones and the wisdom or the access to the agents of wisdom that can be found within. Uh, he's also said to have partaken or, or, or been or have received wisdoms imparted to him by the Archangel Gabriel, uh, one of the main angels uh, of um, not just uh, uh, revelation, uh, but of um, of uh, uh, of the Annunciation, for instance, right? The Hail Mary prayer comes from the words of, 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 of Gabriel, right? Hail Mary, full of grace. Um, that also, interestingly, uh, links us back to geomancy, especially uh, considering that European Renaissance geomancy comes from Arabic uh, ramal practices. Uh, apologies for my terrible accent there. Um, which are often said to have been delivered to, uh, to humanity by the Archangel Gabriel, not just a, a messenger, but a teacher. Uh, and again, this idea of, of, of prophets, of teachers, of angelos, meaning messenger, like we're talking about the, the transmission and rearticulation of, of divine knowledge here. So I'm, I'm quoting Lon Milo Duquette from, uh, uh, from his uh, Enochian vision magic uh, here a little bit, um, thinking about the magic of, of, of Enoch, right? And so we have uh, uh, this report on Enoch by the angel Ave, uh, a couple of ways we can say that, uh, from Dee's diaries. Like, so this is an, a, a spirit that turns up and tells them about Enoch and tells them, reminds them that the Lord appeared unto Enoch and was merciful unto him, opened his eyes that he might see and judge the earth, which was unknown to his parents by reason of their fall, right? So we're also seeing here that uh, Enoch's work is in some way, it is post-lapsarian, it is after the fall, after the, 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 the ejection from, from the Garden of Eden, but it is in some way getting us back to that state of, if not perfect grace, then, then better knowledge of things, right? Uh, for the Lord said, let us show unto Enoch the use of the earth. And lo, Enoch was wise and full of the spirit of wisdom. And here again, we have this idea that wisdom isn't just abstract idealist uh, uh, conceptions of imperium realms and gates of, of heaven and things like that. It's also about the use of the earth. As, as Dee puts it, you also help those prophets with worldly and domestical things, right? And lo, Enoch was wise. Uh, so Duquette says, to my knowledge, Dean Kelly never used the word Enochian to describe the system of magic they received between April 10th and July 13th, 1584. Throughout their actions, they simply referred to it as angelic. Uh, we cannot, however, be faulted too badly for attaching the biblical patriarch's name to the system. The magicians were told that this was the magic given by God to Enoch, the seventh man from Adam, as we've discussed, in the form of a book, and that Enoch, before he ascended bodily into the presence of God, passed it on to others. Over the generations, the book fell into wicked hands and God caused it to be lost. So if God can make it go away, God can also bring it back. But because of Dee's piety and prayers, God was moved to once again deliver it to mankind. So here we have this idea of you are, you are entreating, um, but you are also waiting. <laughs> so the angelical calls uh, of Enoch, um, the calls themselves, so key to... Uh, so many different parts of um, uh, the, the, as I say, the, ver the variety of magical systems we could call Enochian, really begins, uh, as, as Duquette says, uh, on April 10th, uh, 1584. At first, uh, they receive four calls, uh, and this is a laborious process. They are derived letter by letter backwards um, from, and, and, and not just, okay, uh, I see an angel 
uh, pointing at the letter A. I see an angel pointing at the letter G. I see it, but not just that, but they're also drawn from these huge tablets, uh, these huge tables, sorry, uh, of uh, grids of, of lettered, tab these lettered tabulated grids. Now, this is not the first time that D has, has used such things. It's often remarked that D is a, a brilliant cryptographer as well as a mathematician. And so it makes sense that a cryptographer trying to talk to angelic spirits will receive things that look like cryptography, right? That look like codes to break. Um, and this isn't the first time they've done that. There's some stuff in, in, in the, 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 the texts of the thing called Liber uh, Legoeth that kind of do that as well. Uh, but what's interesting here is that they're, they're, they're deriving these very slowly and they receive the calls and then they receive uh, the, the English translation um, of, of what, what, they've just, what they've just pulled out of this. And it's, it takes a very, very long time. And it's, it, it, it seems that even the spirits themselves get a little bit like, all right, can we, can we speed this up, please, about this very laborious process of letter by letter backwards uh, consulting a variety of these, uh, you know, seven by seven or 49 by 49 grids. Um, so much so that after the first four calls, the, the fifth uh, to the 18th calls are received far more straightforwardly uh, and given far more quickly, but the translation into English isn't given for another six weeks. And this is considered kind of a cooling off period. They're received backwards because they're so powerful. They're said to, to, to potentially move so many think to move heaven and earth so much that we that, that, that they're, they're, they're to be received carefully right um and by the 13th of june d's birthday uh, at that point uh, the 19th call is received and it's revealed to be a master call for the 30 aethers so the 19th call is revealed to be pretty much standard for the 30 aethers uh for the, the parts of mm, uh, uh for the parts of uh uh these realms should we say at this point that they're, they're kind of male merged in. You just add in the name of the, so the 19th prayer remains pretty much the same. You just add in the name of the ether that you are unlocking or exploring or receiving visions from. And so total that creates these, these 48 calls or 49. Technically there's one at the start as well, but you don't need to get into that. Enochian is full of these little things where you can say this is broadly true, except for this other thing that the angels say later or before. Um, so again, I'm I'm trying to pray see this in, in 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 thumbnail. And so if you are sat there being like that's 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 inaccurate, um, then 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 we can talk about that uh, uh, at the end. Um, notice here this this picture of uh, this this uh, woodcut of Ed Kelly uh, actually has him looking at uh, Trithemius's uh, geomantic uh, sigils. Interestingly, so they receive these calls, uh, which are received letter by letter or, or sometimes you know in whole words they write them down d even sometimes asks the angels for a pronunciation guide uh or at least notes how many syllables some of these words which often look quite alien to an english speaker um and then they have this language right so uh, but they're also you know the spirits of the enochian systems here are i would argue uncharacteristically clear concise and um uh kind of straightforward uh about what the angelical language is this celestial speech uh the angel ilamisi says that it is a language taught in paradise by infusion to adam and this infusion is, is an important point the idea that adam has like perfect knowledge because he doesn't just learn it through his imperfect seven head holes of his of his human form he also has knowledge uh beamed into his head by infusion uh by by the lord uh, Gabriel says that uh, Adam not only uh, did know all things under his creation and spoke of them properly, right, using their then their actual true names, we could say, uh, Enochian is the true names of things, naming them as they were, but also was a partaker of our presence and society of, of the angels, right? Yea, a speaker of the mysteries of God, yea, with God himself. So the idea here is that Adam had like direct communication with God, as, as we see in, 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 in Genesis, even if that doesn't necessarily go terribly well for Adam himself. The angel Raphael also turns up a fair bit in, in Dean Kelly's work, and it's, it's Raphael who is explicitly identified as the medicine or the healer of God, who talks about the, we could say, the therapeutic uh, or the affectivity uh, of uh, of, of this, this, this angelical, this Adamical language. He says, respecting our creation, the waters shall stand if they hear their own speech. The idea is that, that, that everything in creation responds to the speech. The heavens shall move and show themselves when they know their thunder. Hell shall tremble when they know what is spoken to them. 
right? So this is the idea that all things, all the, 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 the highest angels and the, and the most fallen demons, uh, which after all are ex-angels uh, by this kind of cosmology, uh, all respond to it. Now, do they like it necessarily? <laughs> no, I mean, if you, if you, you know, uh, consider speaking to, to someone in the lang in the native tongue of their, of the country they've been exiled from, right? Uh, I think about this a lot in terms of uh, utilizing uh, angelical ritual speech in, in my, my, my own conjuration and my own working with a variety of spirits that, um, I've never encountered spirits that, that, that didn't respond to it. Some of them didn't really like it necessarily. <laughs> um, but again, what, you know, to stir spirits does not necessarily mean to, uh, immediately and always have them do exactly what you want first time, right? Uh, conjuration is a deeply personal thing and, and engaged and engages a multitude of, of modalities. We can talk a little bit more about that as we get to it. So the idea here is that this infused knowledge that enables Adam to understand all sciences allows him to know perfectly the nature of all plants, stones, herbs, and animals, and understanding the virtue and properties of the heaven, elements, and stars, perceiving himself finally to have this scepter of domination uh, over all creation, over all creatures. Now, this is a, a common theme in, in this 17th century writing about, about Adam and about Adamical virtue uh, and, and what was lost, right? And I think what's important here is that when we're talking about the scepter of, of, of dominion, we're also talking about uh, Adam's role as caretaker of, of Eden, of Adam as first gardener, uh, as Adam as first uh, animal husbandman, right? Um, and these conceptions of of ruling, but also understanding, and again, also having agreements with, I think is, is, is very important for us. But again, the wider endeavor of the early modern period and, 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 uh, and arguably the, the rise of, you know, um, a variety of things called the scientific methodologies, uh, inductive logic, those kinds of uh, empiricisms, um, are also present in this desire to find the truest way to describe nature in order to understand it, in order to, you know, shepherd it back to a, 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 a more perfected state. Um, to deal with the, the oncoming apocalypse of many early modern millenarianisms. So this isn't just a, a thing about linguistics or a thing about theology. This is also a thing about like how nature is engaged with on, on a pretty fundamental level. I also think it's important when we're talking about these books, that they're books of wisdom, but they, they're also explicitly kind of grimoric in some senses as well. These handbooks of, of how to uh, talk to, how to call, how to cohere, how to stir, as well as direct and potentially deploy or, or charge spirits. Um, David, uh, so the, the, the books attributed to, to Adam, uh, along with these books in stones, uh, one of the, the most famous ones is the, the Sefer Ratziel, which is said to have been given by the angel Ratziel uh, when uh, uh, Adam, is, Adam and Eve are, are, are ejected from the garden, right? It's kind of a how to survive in the woods uh, book for them. Um, they're said to have been passed down from Adam as well once he's received them. Those early modern magical practitioners working with the Sefer Ratzel from this cultural context could consider that they were not merely appealing to Adam as first magician in some abstract sense, but were working from a direct transmission of his established lineage. The Sefer Ratzel has a, a, a bunch of Adamical material, including uh, the things called semaphores, which we should separate too much from any conception of like the Shem HaMeferesh or the, the 72 angels or anything. The semaphores seem to be these um, points of ritual speech where Adam said this thing in the garden, when Adam uh, you know, spoke with God or when Adam named the animals or when Adam spoke to the winds or, or spoke to the trees, right? There, there are these uh, magical speech acts. Um, so in using them and finding them in, in Seferatza, which is incredibly popular work for English magicians in the 16th century, then again, they're not just like abstractly saying, oh, we think, uh, you know, Adam was a magician and I'm a magician and that's the only connection here. No, you are potentially working with the same thing that Adam received. It was considered that the prophet Enoch, who had relearned the Adamic tongue and thus recovered something of the perfect prelapsarian knowledge of the garden, had also consulted the wondrous book of Ratzel that had originally been given to Adam. It thus also seems to offer additional context when considering sources of the angelical language received by Dee and Kelly. So that's all well and good. That's some, that's some nice history there. Like what have people been doing with this and where, what, what does this have to do with a, a book that I, 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 I published this year? Well, um, a number of years ago, uh, I, I came uh, into possession of a very, very short pamphlet really 
uh, which is Suleiman Russell's An Enochian Grimoire, uh, which takes a ritual charm approach to the Enochian language and really spotlights the language itself over the ritual furniture of, say, the Siglum Dea Math or the, the Holy Table or the, or the Grand the, the, the Tabula Sancta or any number of other parts of, of, of various things uh, that are used in, 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 in systems of Enochian magic. The, the, the grimoire that, that, that Russell produced, um, which again, I, I, I came across like, I don't know, 10 more plus years ago, it's been a while, um, is kind of uh, divided into two parts. The first part is uh, a set of the, the basic grimoire, which was intended to be used in concert as part of an actual ceremony. Uh, for instance, here, the, the Conjuration of the Flame, which is taking parts of uh, the angelical calls uh, that already existed and, uh, and, and essentially like producing cut-ups or, or, if we want to argue, taking versicles from them in the manner that we might turn a psalm into a charm through a variety of, of, of using the, 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 the parts of this sacred ritual language, right? These are parts of uh, a variety of calls that are, are used here in isolation to literally light the flame of the candle that you are that you put on your altar to be able to do your magic. So the first part of them is a set of modular things to say when you pour libations, when you light the incense, when you cast your circle, right? Like a kind of very utilitarian model for a, for a conjurer. The second part of Suleiman's uh, uh, of Russell's uh, Inarchian Grimoire was um, additional charms and incantations, and these are interesting because they are less uh, versicles selected from the extant corpus of uh, Enochian calls and are translations of other charms into the angelical language, right? Um, and that's fascinating to me. So here's an example of a counter charm to undo another sorcerer's works against you. So the important things to bear in mind here is that both of these like parts of the text are, are extracting versicles. Some of them are translations of old charms. And Russell also talks about how he hypothesized new words as compounds of old words. Uh, one of his examples is that there doesn't seem to be a clear word in the in D's like Enochian corpus of words of the language for love. Um, uh, and so uh, I believe Russell puts together a compound uh, noun for love, which uh, of, of words that already exist in the in angelical corpus. Now, various people who've studied the, the language point out that the Enochian seems to already be pretty compound. There are definitely examples where uh, we're given a translation for a word that we can clearly see is derived from two or more root um, words in Enochian that, that already exist, right? So he's hypothesizing new words. His word for love, I think, is commos. Um, uh, mos is joy, and com is often uh, 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 like, like comma, uh, trust together. Right. So we have this idea of like love to like uh, like loving togetherness, I guess we could argue, or like a, a love that is experienced together, that kind of thing. So this was a big inspiration for me to start working with versicles of the extant Enochian corpus in when I was, you know, making a spiritual bath or when I was like pouring libations. Um, and so this was a, a big inspiration for me in, in terms of working with uh, the ritual language outside of, you know, the 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 heptarchia or the Libra Goth or, or any like particular like more systemized approaches to the magic that D was was receiving. So the idea of of of, of jamming Enochian and and geomancy or angelical language and geomantic divination together is not entirely new. There is some precedent for it, a little bit at least in the early modern period. Uh, as I've said, I think these things work very neatly together because they're both about ultimately mapping and articulating the fundamental affectivity, affective virtues of nature, right? Uh, a best language for articulating a best wisdom, we could say. I also like the idea that uh, angelical geomancy is, is, is where the starlight meets the earth. And again, we have that dirt astrology thing coming in. Overall, the idea here is that you are stirring the virtues of, of uh, uh, and spirits cohering around the geomantic figures, these patterns of, of nature, right? It's for uh, affecting those patterns as well as describing them. And as I say, I think there's some historical precedent for this. If we look to uh, Harley manuscript uh, 6482 uh, in a, uh, a little table, it's a very small section, but a little table which uh, relates the, the characters of the 16 figures of geomancy expressed in the great and lesser squares of tabula sancta. So in other words, what we're seeing here are the letters that the Enochian language is said to be written in. So it, it, we, we, we're given 
it in um, in in Roman uh, 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 letters, uh, such as I'm using to to write English here. Uh, but the language itself also has its own alphabet. Uh, and at a certain point, various angels say you really should uh, write them all out, not in uh, the the Roman Latin letters you're using, but in the the angelical letters. And he even kind of says, like, do I have to though? Um, so what we see here is, a, is, is some fundamental correspondence tables. Magicians love their tables, right? Uh, and we see here that the various letters are corresponded in a kind of gematria to the, the figures of geomancy as well. Um, so along with the idea that both Angelical and geomancy have a patron prophet, a first father who is engaged with both of them, uh, for Adam is often considered a geomancer as well, uh, and a delivering angel in common, usually Gabriel. There's also literally this endeavor, it seems, to uh, be able to relate the Enochian language, in this case, the, Enochian, the, 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 the orthography and the, and the letter system for articulating the Enochian in its truest form, with, with geomancy, with this, these patterns that map different uh, affectivities of nature and of people and of, and of environment and spirits. So what does this end up producing? Uh, it ends up producing like this, for, in, for instance. So I'm doing this book launch uh, for, for Watkins. Uh, I, I'm here to celebrate the wisdom uh, uh, of our ancestors as well as like of, 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 of the wisdom contained in books themselves, of, of the, the magic of grimoires themselves and so on. And so it felt very apt to celebrate with uh, the mercurial figure of Albus, uh, the white, uh, the, the um, this is the white of the, the hair of sages of our elders, the white of the yellowing scrolls and the bones of the corpus of the, the wisdom of the dead, I would argue. It's a mercurial figure of, uh, and it's Mercury as librarian, I often argue. Uh, and so what I ended up doing was uh, pulling together a bunch of versicles from different uh, calls from the, as I say, from the, the extant uh, Enochian calls that Dean Kelly received. And uh, uh, and intoning those over a variety of my my geomantic uh, spirit houses. Uh, this is the, the 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 kind of spirit vessel, if you want to call it that, or or, or muster point uh, that I use to talk to uh, spirits that also like that kind of librarian mercurial wisdom infrastructure of information kind of thing. That's their deal. And so when you mark the form of of, of Albus and when you build up a a thing of uh, sympathetic material, you can more easily cohere spirits to that thing. And I put together uh, this call by uh, this this new prayer by intoning parts of the versicles over with the spirits and in tandem with them, sometimes with bits of, of, of dream incubation, sometimes with random flashes of inspiration and spirit contact, but an awful lot of like judicious editing on my part uh, to make these prayers uh, work uh, and to ensure that uh, they didn't just sound nice, but they were also tangibly affecting spirits around me uh, through my own uh, geomantic spirit practice. So I'll give you the English for this rather than launching straight into the Enochian, because I think it's very important that you have a good idea about what's being said uh, magically or what's being cohered magically around you. Uh, I have no interest in, in hypnotizing anyone with secret uh, subliminal angelical messages here. Um, I'm going to translate the, the prayer of, uh, of Albus that I ended up putting together as... Um, uh, it's yadna yadnamad, right? Knowledge of pure knowledge. Uh, and I find it very helpful to have the, the form of the figure around when you are, certainly when you, or, or a, a spirit house of some kind, um, when you are intoning these. That doesn't mean you require building one of these things, but simply marking the form of Albus or one of its its sigils. And its sigils are literally connecting the dots here, right? Um, again, I think about this as the, the form of the figure is a haunted doorway that spirits can be called through from in this case, spirits of like learning and scholarship and wisdom. And that these connected, that these connecting the dots of the of the form of the figure, these geomagical characters or sigils are kind of like weaving a net or a web that kind of catches uh, and allows you to cohere some of the, the, the spiritual force and, and, and sometimes entities that come through. So this is the prayer I use for, for stirring those spirits and for uh, encouraging communion and, and receiving wisdom from them. Uh, this is you know, one of the main things I use for, for working with most of my tutelary spirits, for instance, uh, because again, the emphasis is on wisdom and the transmission of wisdom. Honor, it is said, speaks of the knowledge of pure knowledge, the brightness of the song of honor in the humility of elders, to know the secrets of truth and understand the secret wisdom of the power of understanding and the mysteries of memory. P 
Peace to those that visit in peace, the elders that understand, for they understand lower truth and higher truth, and hearken the voicings of the oak in the house of death, beneath whose branches lanterns shine in the temple of your mind. In the name of your stars unto the earth, arise, you spirits of elders that understand and visit the earth. Move and show yourselves, open the mysteries of your creation, be friendly unto me and visit with the power of understanding. Behold these deeds and work wonders, be it made with power. And so this is one of the 19 calls that are contained in, in, this, in this new little book. It's, it's, it's a little slim, but the idea is that they, they all pack a punch in some way. So this idea of elders that understand is, is, is I think, pertinent here. The angelical language uh, doesn't have its mythic origins in the experiments of Dean Kelly but in the elevation, wisdom, and the transmissions of Enoch, and ultimately the perfectly knowledgeable magic and pacts of Adam as first diviner and first magician. So while historically we can say it doesn't hit the scene until, you know, 1580s, uh, the idea is that the, the spirits that turn up to deliver it say, oh, it is far older and far more ritually and spiritually and magically significant uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and potent. What I found with it, using it, and this is, you know, experiential stuff as a, a professional diviner and, 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 and sorcerer for uh, a good number of years now, uh, is that it, there are some applications in broader spirit communication. It seems potentially any spirits are, are moved in some way by the angelical language. Uh, that means we can partly pull out particular conjurational terms and phrasings to use in wider conjurations. A lot of the, the language around, uh, you know, like I was talking about stirring spirits, zixle, to stir, right? Zorge, arise, uh, sorry, uh, uh, be friendly unto me, right? Uh, Torosu, arise, right? Come, you know, come here. Uh, the words to, you know, to not just call a spirit, but to, um, uh, to cohere it if it's, you know, uh, a bit too uh, frenetic to like, uh, uh, to, 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 to give it some encouragement to, to be louder if it's a bit quiet. Right, these ways of not just saying a bunch of passwords that force the universe to have to do things, treating these prayers less like cheat codes and more like ways of alluring and uh, attending to the dynamic interrelationship between you and your engagement with your ecology of spirit. Uh, and the idea here is that supposedly perfect speech uh, can be used to perfect your results, is the idea. So whether or not you are calling spirits or charging them to do a thing or directing them to go off somewhere, and here's where this isn't just about talking to spirits for me, it's also about uh, producing tangible spellcraft. You know, uh, one of the, the little points here, this, this little guy here is a, is a little charm I made for a, for a friend of mine uh, for improved memory, uh, which again is, is, is a big Albus thing, right? Uh, and so I, I, was, I had that there and I was praying over this in order to empower this with those prayers, right? So there's, there's a tangible thing that's going on as well. Uh, and so, uh, Nazar uh, is a, a set of 19 of these, these new angelical calls for stirring and directing the spirits and virtues in 16 figures. So along with uh, a, a call for each figure, such as the one you saw for Albus there, there's also three prayers, one to open divination, one to close divination, and one to clear difficult charts. Um, there is a concept in geomancy that it is not always uh, appropriate to, to divine. And if one figure in particular, the, the inverse of Albus, Albus is this, the upside down of Albus, Rubius, uh, is considered a figure that halts the reading. Uh, and so there is a prayer there if that does fall in order to clear those potentially uh, negative forces, which again speaks to me of the, the image magic inherent in geomancy, that when you have cast a figure, you've not just measured something, you've also lit a beacon. And so a variety of spirits that are attracted to that flavor of energy, whether that's, you know, libraries and calm study, or, you know, Rubius's deceit and uh, self-destruction, right? They're going to be attracted to that thing. So you have to clear your divination space sometimes as well. Uh, and so uh, that's uh, what, I, what I ended up putting together. Uh, uh, and what I was very grateful that Hadian ended up putting out in these, these two beautiful forms of the, the, the softback here and, uh, and indeed the hardback, uh, both of which come with this... Uh, this heraldic device that was that, I, that I, I had a dream in which uh, a bunch of these spirits turned up and showed me what the, the book looked like, which needed to look like this, uh, these 19 pouring vessels. And so the 19 uh, comes from uh, a particular uh, Enochian uh, versicle found in the fifth key, 
um, which speaks of God giving um, humanity these 19 vessels, these, these pillars of gladness uh, with which to water the earth. The, 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 the phrase is uh, Amipsi, Nazoth, Athod, Deluga, Zizop, Zelida, Kaoski, Tolpogi, right? I have fastened pillars of gladness 19 and given you vessels with which to water the earth. And that's where this rather long winded title ends up coming from. Uh, and these 19 uh, therefore represent the, the container and also the, the liquid contained within that pours forth and that hopefully coheres uh, new generations of, of, of uh, magicians, conjurers, folk healers to experiment with these uh, with these calls and with these ways of stirring and directing spirits uh, in order to materialize spellcraft and in order to to understand ourselves and the world we we live in uh, in, in hopefully more useful and better ways. And I think that's about all I had to to tell you about. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> uh, I'm more than happy to to answer any particular questions people might have about. Uh, either the process or about how I've worked with these or uh, I've been really excited since it's it's been out to talk to diviners who aren't geomancers about using the the opening and closing prayers which they've which which a bunch of people that have, have reached out to me have said they found incredibly effective for increasing mediumship um for getting more insight in their readings uh, as well as connecting more thoroughly with other people's spirits when they read for them so uh I, I I'm really excited to talk about some of the the applications of this but also uh, happy to attend to any questions if you're like what 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 do you mean by this thing uh I, yeah i'd love to be able to explain this thing that i've been working from my own geomantic practice uh of, as, as a professional diviner for people being able to not just map what patterns are going on for them but also to say hey this pattern is useful for you you should like nail it down and cohere it more you can use this prayer this call to stir spirits to help get that thing uh more in your life as it is helpful as it has been marked by my spirits talking to your spirits talking to the spirits of the oracle so these emerged out of like very much the practice of my uh, professional divining, uh, and I'm really excited to put them into to people's hands. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a phenomenal question. So for me, I'm I'm more interested in using angelical language in my geomantic divination and magic than I am in uh, fitting geomancy into the wider corpus of, of Enochian magic. So for me, it's um, it's been very much a helpful way to further talk to the spirits that cohere around a geomantic practice, around the, the library spirits that I work with to have a, a better memory and be able to you know keep all of these manuscripts uh, uh, in my mind and things like that. Um, so I found it incredibly effective for uh, speaking to uh, spirits of um, like, so working with like spirits around Albus, like mercurial spirits, we could argue they like they, they certainly turn up for mercurial things. There's a sympathy there. Are they mercurial spirits in a strict like Celsus or, 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 or Michael Scott kind of like taxonomy of spirits? I'm less interested in that than I am in in, in classifying spirits and more in terms of like, what, what are they like when they turn up? Um, my experience of working with like uh, of, of, of working it has been a lot more uh, planetary and a lot more geomantic in short and a lot more elemental. Um, I have done bits of like, uh, I've worked with the the, the planetary seniors uh, in, in other kinds of Enochian magic I've done in the past. Um, again, because they're a little bit planetary. Um, I've also employed Enochian in work with more unclean spirits uh, that we might find in some of the grimoires that get called goetic. Uh, and they also respond. Some of those spirits, you know, uh, will remind you that they used to be angels uh, uh, and so are like kind of glad to be treated like they're still angels spoken in that language. Others really don't like it. Uh, as I say, it seems to remind them of of of, uh, of, of the paradise they're not allowed in anymore. Um, and uh, I've I'm, 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 I'm uh, I, but I, I don't know if that's because of other things I'm doing in my practice, or if that's like a universal that everyone else is going to experience. Again, in talking about and trying to teach and, and make resources available for, 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 for magical practice, uh, I'm always aware of this tension of, uh, of, of showing as well as telling in order that people can build their own magical practice rather than an impression of someone else's. Uh, and so this tension of like trying it for yourself. For instance, I've included no um, pronunciation guide uh, in this it's it's my opinion that 
there that the, the spirits can generally tell what you mean um uh, if you if you're absolutely butchering it they might turn up and correct you um but uh they that I, I think working out how you say the words how it settles in your own body how you work out your own kind of accent in the language if we want to put it like that uh is a way of like cohering it in your body and and, and, and aligning yourself to it and 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 the spirits that can speak it um so i haven't included a pronunciation guide because i think there should be many ways of of of, of saying it and using it in that way and that's also why that the, the the book itself is pretty low on instructions it's it's these prayers it's a, there's an introduction to like what, what i'm what i'm about with them and then they're they're there for people to play with and experiment with uh, and I've, as 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 you, as you said at the beginning i've included the actual angelical language uh the script if you can see that there as well as uh, the angelical in the English letters and uh, and the English translation. And I encourage people to play with it in writing in charms uh, and petition papers uh, of, uh, of of making art about it, of, of uh, saying them over your, your images and talismans, and really just to, to, to see how they play out. Um, I hope that was in some way towards answering at least uh, one of the questions there, Carl. Oh, literally biblical. Yeah. A lot of the yeah. time it's, it's itself. Um, if I say quoting the Bible, the idea is that the, the human Bible comes after uh, uh, the, the, the words of Anarchy. And so the way D I think would understand it is that this is what the Bible is quoting, but there are definitely like the wings, uh, the, the wings of the winds, uh, uh, beautiful line. There are all sorts of like little lines that are, are, are expressly biblical language. Yes, absolutely. And again, as you say, this kind of quite bombastic style. It's it's a pretty small vocabulary for what we have. There are only these like nineteen calls uh, uh, and a bunch of other words that are sometimes given by the angels in conversation as well. To be fair, um, but yeah, I, I was on a, a podcast with uh, some friends uh, talking about this book recently and, and, and remarked that like. Yeah, Enochian's tricky because it, 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 to, to give it a, an example, like there the doesn't seem to be a, a solid translational word for love, but there are like four for like a through thrusting fire, right? There's, it, so it, it has, you know, you want to talk about raining uh, live scorpion heads and sulfur on your enemies, it's got you, right? You want to talk about like more modern concepts, it's going to struggle. But that itself is interesting to me, especially in terms of translating extant folk charms into angelical because there isn't often a one-to-one -one word and so you have to kind of like work out what's the closest thing to it and then take that to the spirits and be like does this make sense to you uh maybe do some divination on it to confirm that this is going to stir the things you want it to stir and not do a bunch of other things that you don't want it to do uh yeah it's 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 a it's it's a a fascinating corpus to explore and to and to kind of re-articulate yeah I see what you're saying, right? Yeah, uh, this is this is the character of Enochian spirits. Yeah, potentially. I mean, certainly in working, like, what's what's an Enochian spirit versus a spirit that turns up when you're speaking Enochian, right? That's what really interests me. I'm less interested in exploring what you know Medini has to say about this system than I am about what the spirits I'm already working with can do, uh, uh, can be more empowered by in work and 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 our and our contact and communion and conjuration can be clearer and more powerful through using that uh, with these other spirits. But the certainly like the spirits that turn up to like formal Enochian magic. Yeah. They, 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 they seem, you know, the, the, the old joke about, you know, you, you, you summon them wanting to win the lottery and they're like, sure, we can do that. But first we have to explain to you why the planets are in the order they're in and how all of creation was, was made. Right. They, they, they get very cosmic very quickly, uh, very often. Uh, and I, I'm not the only like magician who's uh, uh, experimented with Enochian who, who who's who's said that. Um, uh, I'm not I'm not claiming to, to to have any you know terribly new insights into that stuff. But what interests me is that it, it, the, the the corpus of of of, of the things called Enochian magics uh, have been experimented with since D like almost immediately. Like the, the, a lot of the material was transmitted by Merrick Casalban in a true and faithful relation of what occurred between John D and some spirits, which is mostly a big character assassination of D. And it's where we get this idea that like, oh, he was fooled by these devilish spirits that pretended to be angels. And I'm not here to suggest whether or not that that that's true or not. Again, I'm not working with Enochian spirits so much as spirits that can speak angelical, spirits that can, that, that, that remember Adam, right? Things like that. Um, 
and so yeah there's there's a there's a a, a bunch of ways that these um these tools this commonwealth of a language uh, has been rearticulated uh, one uh pretty famous Enochian uh, magician of the uh, relatively recent period, uh, Benjamin Rowe, who, who passed away uh, a, a number of years ago, uh, pointed out that, uh, you know, Enochian is very much a, 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 a set of magics with a tradition of innovation, not just the golden dawn, kind of like bringing all their bright colors and like truncated pyramids and fancy further ritual furniture into Dee's Enochian magic, but also the period between uh, the, the 16th and the 19th century had an awful lot of people, it seems, experimenting with uh, finding ways of using parts of the angelical language, such as the the, the table in uh, the Harley manuscript I spoke of. Um, but also you see like Enochian words turning up in conjurations in 17th century handbooks that don't otherwise mention any Enochian magic. So the, the idea that like this is a, a commonwealth that we can draw from, if this is the language of Adam, this is the, the language that like every... Uh, you know, living being on earth can potentially uh, access and have um, have a sense of uh, uh, responsibility to as well as um, as well as uh, uh, um, privilege to work. Um, yeah, that, that's that's I think one of the main things that excites me about the location of the angelical speech as a damical and not simply being um, a, a ritual language you can only use for talking to Enochian spirits. Um, because I, I feel that like common cauldron wealth kind of thing of, of like Adam and all living creatures uh, over the idea of uh, it being used to, for its very particular political ends uh, in the 16th century to help like spy on the King of Poland and, you know, bolster the British Empire. Uh, and I hope there is some uh, decolonialism possible from within uh, uh, how, especially, you know, English magicians approach uh, this kind of corpus of stuff as, a, as something that can help us understand nature better than simply uh, rule over it and use it to rule over others. Uh, so hopefully power for use and, uh, and community over uh, uh, God telling us that uh, the angels say God's on our side and to, you know, wipe out other people <laughs> instead of taking it to a, a slightly darker place. So I think in part the language responds to some of the uh, aspirations of the people that received it, of Dee and Kelly, you know, and of and of their context, um, as well as saying something about the kind of spirits that they wanted to talk to. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm not an expert in it in any shape or form, but my my very good friend uh, Ben Joffe, uh, who's a, a scholar of like Tibetan. Uh, all sorts of uh, Tibetan uh, religion and magic uh, and Tantra and has done translation for uh, a variety of, uh, of, uh, of, of gurus. Um, yeah. They, when I talked to him about this stuff, he's like, Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like very similar ideas about uh, or, or very comparable notions of the revelation of uh, wisdoms that are hidden in the earth in some way, or that like are revealed to people and are then meant to be passed on and that they're meant to be, like the fact that they're revealed is part of their power, but also that they kind of look like um, uh, that they that they they carry the same forms uh, that are traditional. That's how you know. That's how you can tell a new good one from a new bad one. Like that kind of thing is fascinating to me. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's comparisons and and contrasts uh, to be made uh, with a variety of ways that people engage with text, spirit, uh, and the articulation of those mysteries. Right? How language uh, 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 passes things on. Like the, the 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 kind of deep history of it of 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 how to transmit across great periods of time or or, or, or mythic um, understandings, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let me find that quote from from because um, I I quoted him because it was so good from from Benjamin wrote who wrote as um, Joshua Norton online at the the had a whole website full of amazing uh, uh, works on, on Enochian. I thoroughly recommend it. Here's the quote. It's from his uh, Enochian magic reference. He says, um, given the bare bones nature of the original Enochian material, magicians have to improvise extensively to make it into an effective general purpose magical system. The history of the system's use is a history of innovation. Every magician or group that has used it extensively has added their own distinct character to it, taking it in a direction at least slightly different from anyone else. 
that has evolved as the viewpoints of its users have evolved and seems perfectly capable of adapting to many viewpoints without stress. So yeah, that would be one of my big emphases is like, you, you don't need to buy a, like a ton of like Enochian books and history and theory and practice in order to just read some prayers, to read some calls, to feel how they respond uh, in doing them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, folks can reach me at my incredibly imaginatively titled website, which is my name, uh, www.alexandercummins.com. Uh, you can find like my publications there. Uh, I'm in the process of putting up an awful lot of class recordings of online classes that I taught over the last couple of years onto my website so folks can buy them and, and download the, the recordings and, and, and watch and study them in their own time and on their own schedule. Um, uh, I have a variety of, of online classes I do. I don't think I have anything coming up just yet, but I'll have some announcements for some classes uh, towards the end of December. And definitely I have a whole bunch of, of, of exciting things coming up uh, uh, in the new year. Easiest way to keep track of that is to sign up to my Friends of English Magic mailing list. Um, please don't sue me, Susanna Clark. Um, and that's, you can find that on my website as well. You can also just drop me a line if you're particularly interested in some aspect of this. Um, uh, I love getting emails. It's nice to to, to be digital pen pals with people or to, and to correspond about some stuff. Um, and as long as people bear in mind that I'm I'm usually juggling about twelve different ritual responsibilities in some way. My turnaround is about a week in replying, but I I enjoy talking about the the particularities of this stuff. And people can reach out to me at consultantsorcerer at gmail dot com. Um, yeah, I, I think that's um, thereabouts. Um, mostly what I, I have to say. I've, I've been on a couple of podcasts and things like that. Uh, uh, friends and colleagues like uh, Alexander over at Glitch Bottle had a good chat about this, as well as uh, I mentioned the chat I had with with Austin and Marshall on uh, the Southern Bramble podcast as well. Uh, and so folks can can find me banging on about this uh, uh, in a couple of other ways and places and with, with other people as well, if they're, they're interested in hearing more. There's a couple more. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I, I try and um, make my procrastination work for me by working on like at least three books at any one time. And so I do the one I want to do least. Uh, so I feel like I'm like shirking. I'm like, I'm not going to work on that one. I, I'm bored of that at the moment. Uh, well, that's too hard. Uh, I'll work on this one instead. And so uh, using my procrastination to hopefully work on something at all times means I have a couple books. Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely certain which one is going to get finished first. But uh, yeah, excited to, to, to engage with some more. Um, uh, some more grimoires and uh, and a couple of other things um, coming up. The, the uh, is it called the Graveyard Wanderers uh, from. Uh, yes. Yeah, that was coming yes. up. Yes, uh, this guy here from oh. uh, Reveler Press is yeah. is out right now. Um, it is a uh, wonderful book of uh, uh, of uh, Swedish uh, necromancy of necromancy. It, specifically, it's the Trolldom, the, uh, the 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 traditional Swedish folk magic around working with the dead, um, around seeking their blessings, around avoiding their hauntings. Uh, it is uh, a, a reprint of a, a work by the late uh, uh, Thomas K. Johnson uh, by Revelor Press uh, out through uh, the Folk Necromancy and Transmission series, which is a series I, I happen to co-edit with my, my excellent friend, Jesse Hathaway-Diaz and, and Dr. Jen Zarp, who, who runs Revelor. And uh, we were really delighted to get to put this out as a collective work of uh of uh you know of, of folk necromancy um and i i uh there's a bunch of forewords to the various editions and i got to do a, a new forward for this one um so yeah if you're interested in folk magic and working with the dead uh and northern european traditions of such then i, I thoroughly recommend you you check out this new edition yeah Brilliant. Uh, thank so, you so much yeah. carl really yeah. appreciate you having me thank you to, to everyone at watkins for, for helping make this happen and thanks to everyone for turning up really appreciate it thank you